<laughs> now I know what it is. Hey everybody and welcome back to Eggs. Today's special guest is Andrew Ryder. Andrew is an entrepreneur and leadership consultant, advisor to tech giants, government entities, and the Fortune 500. He's also an author and an expert on creating valuable content that works, fueling your business. After leaving school where he triple majored in chemical engineering, applied physics, and chemistry, he set out on an entrepreneurial adventure. However, Andrew quickly soured on the run-of-the-mill, opportunistic, and clickbaity content he saw running rampant online and abruptly turned his focus to an exploration of ethical leadership. From his efforts, he uncovered the idea of a future where aspiring entrepreneurs are equipped with the skills and strategies to grow their business ethically and lead their audiences forward. A future where the incentives of the coach or company are aligned with the incentives of the student or client. Joining us today for an important discussion on topics spanning from self-leadership as an approach to unlocking personal potential, creating a content engine that will ignite a fire under your business, the value of being a vulnerable leader, and so much more. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Andrew Ryder. Hey, Andrew. How are you, man? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thanks so much for uh, making the time to do this. We're uh, grateful to have you and thrilled for the discussion. Yeah. Awesome. Me too. <laughs> well, uh, let's start off at the beginning. Uh, you have an interesting background in chemistry and then get into content writing. That's kind of a weird approach. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. And I, you know, if you would have told me this growing up that I was going to be interested in anything that involved writing, uh, it would have been a hard sell at the time. I hated English class. I hated reading. Uh, you couldn't get me to do that stuff if you tried. And, uh, you know, I was really into math, really into science, and I was good at all that. But when I think about what I really enjoyed doing, not just at school, but what I enjoyed doing growing up, uh, it was creative stuff. I, I grew up with the f- episodes one through three of Star Wars. And so we would we'd listen to the Star Wars episode one soundtrack and we'd build Legos and make these fancy ships and fly them around the basement and then we deconstruct them and make new ships or add new things to them and, and build out these narratives and build these worlds and do all of this imaginative stuff. And I thought that because I was into Legos and because I was good at math and, and all of those types of things that that was leading me in a direction, uh, an engineering direction where you're building things, you're designing things, you're doing math. And it's similar to that. But what I've found more recently is that really the the thing that I enjoyed the most about those those things that I grew up doing and why I was doing them was the creativity. And it, it was the ability to tell stories and to create worlds. And that's a lot of what I do now is storytelling and, and building out worlds. And, and a lot of the stories are similar. You know, I talk about Star Wars or I'll talk about whatever I watched on Netflix the other day and, and uh, have fun with it. But try to communicate a valuable business lesson, marketing lesson, or leadership lesson through the context of that story. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think a lot of people, especially interested in math and science and things like that, tend to sell themselves short when it comes to creativity. Like we, th- we think of it as two separate things or two different sides of the brain or something. And, uh, but I think, you know, there's actually a lot of creativity, you know, built into science, right? This idea that you're going to be testing hypotheses, for example, or, you know, even in math, you know, trying to, you know, solve incalculable problems or, or whatever, you know, for the world, you know, I mean, there really is a lot of creativity involved. And so it's funny how when we think of, you know, like maybe the STEM fields versus the creative fields, you know, I, I mean, maybe there's not perfect alignment, but it's definitely, I think, more creative on both sides and maybe more analytical on both sides than we we give either side credit. So it's kind of interesting. I, I had the same reaction Mike did, which was, you, you did what? Chemical engineering? And then what, what are we doing now? <laughs> Like why? Like there's a big disconnect right there, like in our heads. But I think in reality, it's all kind of the same thing, right? I mean, you're basically now you're looking rather than I, I don't know, doing you know analyzing some chemical punk compound, you're you're analyzing a business and trying to understand the pieces and parts of that organism and how it works together, you know. So I think it's not all that different, even though it feels really really strange. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And there's a whole bunch of things that I learned in in school and in engineering practice that are applicable to to business. It's just, uh, you know, you're, you're building pipelines, you're moving stuff through a sequence. It's just a little bit different with what you're moving, you know, whether it's customers or it's water or it's 
some uh, some type of process that you're working on. So, so what what made you pivot? I got into entrepreneurship sort of in the same way that a lot of a lot of kids get into entrepreneurship. I I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. <laughs> and I just, my mind exploded. I just thought, you know, why had nobody told me that this is something that you could do with your life? You know, I, I remember back in like in high school, for example, we'd have these career days where you'd get to meet people or you'd get to look at a database of all the different possible careers you could have. And, and of course you'd go and you'd look at which ones make the highest average income. And you say, Oh, I want to be a construction manager. Cause they make a lot of money. And it's like, well, you can't just go be a construction man. There's other things you got to do on the way to get there. But, you know, nobody ever told me that I could be an entrepreneur, that I could start a business. And and I, I suppose I knew that people did those things. I was aware of it. I just didn't realize it was something that I could do. And so from that point, I went down this path of trying just about everything that you could possibly try. I drop ship stuff uh, from Alibaba to, you know, just a bunch of junk products. I sold uh, real estate, uh, wholesaled land. I did try to start a social media marketing agency without any clue how to run any ads or anything, you know, all the typical stuff that you see people doing online, all the make money online stuff. And I knew that what I was doing, I knew the products that I was, was selling and the marketing that I was creating was unethical. And I knew that the marketing that I was absorbing and and the the things that people were telling me the promises that they were making to me the things that people would say to me on a sales call you know they'd say anything to you to get you to buy and that really didn't sit well with me uh and, and that is a lot of the inspiration that I've taken into you know my current business where I'm trying to do my part to change that, to be straightforward with the marketing, to be honest, to create an honest relationship with the people who are listening to me or who are, um, you know, purchasing something from me. That ethical aspect and ethical leadership is really important to me because I've really been through the ringer with with these biz op gurus and make money online schemes, and you know, if I can help somebody avoid making the same mistakes that I've made. That's a huge win for me. That's a huge thing that motivates me. Yeah. yeah I've, I listened to one of your podcasts that you did with another um, group and uh, you were talking about uh, how your wife went through like some business coaching. You ended, ended up spending like 25 grand and got nothing out of it. Um, so I can see how, you know, that experience would actually kind of you know, get that ethical red flag sticking up there for you. And, and I was gonna uh, say, Mike's got a story like that too. <clears throat> I got a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, it makes sense. And it's actually, it's one of the things that I think it's both the gift and the curse of the internet, right? Because the access to being able to put yourself out there and basically, you know, sell whatever you sell, you know, you used to do it on the street corner. Now you can do it in the public marketplace online. And so it makes people who aren't necessarily ethical or who don't necessarily have the best content or who don't have even the answer, you know, are, are very capable of just sitting down with their, you know, like we were talking about with, with an iPhone or something, and, and they can make a video and a course and, a, and you know, make some kind of promise that's going to suit somebody, you know, somebody who's desperate and looking for something, somebody who needs an answer to a question, somebody, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, and then they find that they've been taken or, or maybe not, maybe sometimes they work out. I don't want to crap on everybody, but, you know, but, uh, but it's certainly fair game that the, these kinds of things are, are rampant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely there's certainly a lot of high quality programs out there. I just, you know, if I was flipping a coin or picking a random program, I had, I had the wrong luck. I was picking the wrong ones, <laughs> but the, uh, especially with make money online as a, as a category or as a niche, you know, people would just do the most insane things to get that opportunity to, to make more money than they're currently making. You know, it's, they'll all say, oh, well, it's only $5,000 for the program and you're going to be making $5,000 a month in the next 90 days. So it's a no brainer, right? And if it works, it's a no brainer, but that's where, you know, a lot of people can't, you know, nobody can guarantee that you're going to be making that money. And a lot of these programs aren't doing a good job of, of vetting people that are coming in who are just so focused on the money that they can't see all of the work and all of the actual skills that you need to build to be able to, to earn that income. And, and so 
it's it's not only enticing for the people who are signing up for these things, but you know, if you were to just go on Instagram right now and just start a new page and you were going to say, I help online coaches scale to six figures per year in the next 90 days, and you throw up a course or you throw up a coaching program, you only have to make that lie for a couple of weeks. You'll have so many people trying to join your program to make that money that you will scale your own business to six figures, even if you've never done it before, just by making that promise. Because there's so many people that are just diving headfirst into entrepreneurship like I was, and they're making these mistakes. They're not building the skills. They're, they're getting pulled off track. And uh, yeah, I think there's just more responsibility needs to be taken on the, the side of the, both the business owner and on the individual who's making these purchases. You know, I, I thought about this a lot because I was sort of angry and disappointed that this had happened to me. I had a lot of emotions and I was like, man, you know, everybody should be ethical. Everybody should, should do a better, better job of selling products that are, that are legitimate. But the reality of the situation is I was the one who purchased them. I made the decision and I needed to take responsibility for that. And that, you know, to me, that looked like becoming a better, a better student, becoming someone who is capable of actually getting results with the programs that I was buying. Even the, even the bad program, you know, like the one you mentioned where what my wife spent a whole bunch of money and they, you know, completely lied to us. There were things that I could have learned from that program if I was in the right place uh, mentally. And if I brought the right approach to it, but I was just so focused on the money that everything else went out the window. Well, you yeah, mentioned I, something specifically in there too. This uh, you, you mentioned that the these people who are selling these courses and things like that don't do a proper job of vetting who's taking them, and I think that that's a really unique observation because I mean, obviously, these courses are out there for anyone to take, right? So they, I mean, they're very easy to get into. You know, you can do a little bit of research, and this is kind of to your point that buyer beware kind of thing, right? I mean, ultimately, it's your responsibility if you decide to pull the trigger. You know, and now there's there's a guy that does a really great podcast where he reviews these things. And there's, I mean, there's a bunch of people out there, you know, doing some of that kind of work, which I think will help people in the future. But um, but one of the things that I, I think is really important about the point you made regarding vetting people is just the inability of people to execute against something they've been taught. You know, so for example, you know, you'll you'll watch these courses. I mean, I've I've bought several of them on my own, you know, on different facets, you know, YouTube channel growth and all these kinds of things, right? And I'll listen to it. I'll listen to it. I'll listen to it. But for some reason, I can never actually do what he's saying. Right. And in my head, because I, I mess with this concept a lot and I'm trying to figure out what the answer to this concept is. I, I, a lot of times I boil down to it being sort of a fear of taking that next step. Maybe you just don't really understand what the next step entails. And so you're kind of afraid to just put yourself out there and do it. But to your point about vetting, you know, if you don't have some of these skills that maybe even inadvertently the author of the course didn't think were critical or weren't important, you know, whether it's critical thinking or the ability to take uh, critique or the ability to, you know, execute against this plan, you know, maybe you need like some fundamental skills that you just don't have that make you a bad candidate for that course. And, uh, you know, ethical or non-ethical, you know, maybe they don't know, maybe they do, you know, but I think that there's something really to that idea that, that people have such a hard time executing against what they're learning that maybe with a little vetting or a little pre, you know, upfront, you know, interview, you know, skill check or something, you could, you could improve the outcomes. Yeah. I think there's a couple of things there that, that you really keyed on, keyed in on. So the first is, you know, with respect to vetting, if you don't vet people, you know, it's, it's like, well, why am I going to turn somebody down because they're going to pay me money? Well, you, you quickly find out that you'd rather have your sanity, your peace of mind, your confidence than chasing a client around the internet or, or giving somebody, you know, somebody is not prepared and they spend a bunch of money with you. They don't get a very good result. It's easier if you just get people into your program who actually want to be there. They're ready to do the work. They're excited about it. They've got enough money to pay for it. You don't have to harangue them all the time and chase them down. It just makes for a miserable experience for you as the coach or as the course creator. And you, you find that well, so to go back to this example we were talking about before with this, this program that my wife and I invested in, the guy who led this program spent more time dealing with collections agencies and writing threatening emails to his clients 
and recording really abusive videos and doing all of this stuff to try to compel people or bully people into paying him because everyone in the program was trying to get out of their, out of their contract. And, you know, that's the business you could be in if, if you want to be, you know, no one's going to stop you from doing that. But he, he even went so far as to get a name change because so many people were talking smack about him on Facebook and trying to get people to, to know that he was a, a scam artist. And it's like, you know, how far are you going to go to, to make that scam work? There's a, there's a quote I really like from Charlie Munger and it goes something like, something like this. He says that if, if all the crooks knew how much money you could make by being honest, they'd all be ethical business people. And, and that really, you know, that really speaks to me because I think that there is money to be made by working with people who actually want, they know what they're getting and they want it and they're willing to, to pay you for it. And it's just so much, so much more fun. and so much easier to do it that way than to try to rip people off. Yeah. I actually really appreciate that quote. Uh, it reminds me of like another one that's like, uh, dirty hands equals clean money, you know, you put mm. in the hard work and do it right. Um, you know, instead of trying to take the easy route and avoid the blister, you, you just do the hard work and get it done. And, and you actually appreciate the money you make. Um, what can you tell us about what you do with content writing? Um, uh, it, it, it's kind of its own unique field. Um, ha- tell us about your first client and, um, you know, how that went for you. Sure. So, you know, I've been moving in this direction more and more so over the last couple of years in that I really have a passion for this aspect of, of content creation more than a lot of the other business strategy, um, business tactic type problems. And um, so with, with content, what I, what I do is I try to help folks to tell a story that is not just, it doesn't just explain what they do, or it doesn't just give away tips, but it, builds a relationship with their audience and it really transforms the way that their audience thinks about their problem. So there's another quote that I really like from Derek Sivers, who's a, he's an entrepreneur. He started a, he, I, he started a music company back in yes. like the nineties or something. Yeah. CD baby. Yeah. And uh, anyways, he sold his company, but he wrote a book about it. And um, there's this quote from the book. He says that if information was all you needed we'd all be billionaires with perfect apps. And I just love that because it, it reminds me that just having the access to the information, you know, if I'm going to publish a whole bunch of tips about how to write content, most people aren't going to do it. They're going to have some kind of mental block or they're not going to be consistent with it, or they're, you know, something will come up, they'll get distracted by something else. And so that I've, what I've found is the best way or the most sustainable way to do it is really to focus on your uniqueness and the, the unique lens through which you see the world and sharing that with your audience through story and then inviting your customers, inviting people to, to come into that world with you. So this kind of goes back to the idea of you know building these worlds and flying the Star Wars ships around my basement, combining all the Legos and doing stuff like that is that's, that's what I'm really passionate about. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I like to help, help clients with. And I feel like there's so many misconceptions or there's so many strict rules, maybe you call them sacred cows in the online business space about how to create content that a lot of people are, they're starting these businesses around something that they're really passionate about a problem that they themselves solved. You know, I work with a lot of coaches and course creators. So these are folks who are solo entrepreneurs. They're, they're trying to start a business. It's based on something that they're good at, something that they learned a skill, a problem that they can solve and they're passionate about it. Yet they struggle to get out there every day or a couple of times a week or however, however, however often they're publishing and they're struggling with it. And it seems, it seems to me like if you're passionate about this, you ought to be able to write something about it every day without any trouble. But all of these systems have really locked people in to a rigid framework. And I, I think this has happened on accident, but it's, 
the way most of the systems work in, in the online business space, especially for content creation, is you're sort of making all of the people who take this course or who use this framework fit into the structure of the framework in a way that makes all of the content that comes out of the use of that framework really generic and sound really, really similar. I can go on Instagram and I can look at people's content and I can sometimes tell what courses they've taken based mm-hmm. on the templates and the headlines and just the, the way their content sounds because they're copying someone else. And that's, you know, that's really unfortunate. Um, it, it's not good for, got not good for sales. <laughs> that's for sure. So I, I try to reverse it and I try to use a system that can adapt to the uniqueness of the entrepreneur, to the stories and the lessons and the everything that makes you as a person unique and the way that you see the world unique. And that's, you know, that's really what people need to hear. And that's, if they're going to end up buying anything at all, they're going to buy it from someone they trust and from someone whose perspective they enjoy listening to. Yeah. I, to, to sort of pile on that, I mean, not to toot our own horn here at the show, but I mean, you're, you're like our 260th interview or something like that, right? We've been interviewing people for a long time and we, and we talked to a lot of startup founders and CEOs, people are really passionate about the work that they do. And so, and I just want to reinforce your point by saying that each of them comes on and expresses their story, right? We have the conversation just like we're having with you now, where it's not all business, right? But we want to, we want to know about them and we want to share something about them and their lives and, and learn a little bit about them as people. And it's funny that even though everybody has their own story, they're all very similar. Like we've seen, we've come across a number of threads, you know, that seem to be very common across different groups of people, you know, maybe there's eight or 10 of them or whatever that you could sort of put all 260 interviews in. Right. And, uh, but each of them has their own approach to it. So, so to your point or your methodology, I guess, the idea is that people would then would be able to focus on their way of telling that story. It's not about innovating the idea that, you know, relationships are important. I mean, I think most people agree with that. I mean, I, my whole agency is built on that idea. That's what you're doing as well. Um, you know, so, but we don't tell the story the same way. Right. And, uh, and I think, you know, what you're saying is that we should be allowed to do it from our own perspective. And in fact, through your program, you actually encourage that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, yeah, what you're keying into is there may be eight or 10 story archetypes, right. As we call them, or like you think of the hero's journey, uh, by Joseph Campbell, right. That's a story archetype. Once you, yeah, once you see a, sto- a, a one story archetype. So one that I'm thinking about a lot lately, this is in the front of my mind because I'm writing a book about it, is this idea from The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy follows the yellow brick road to seek out this wizard only to go through all these hurdles and trials and tribulations. She gets there and she finds out it's just a dude with a fancy machine, right? He's got a computer and Then she learns, she's trying to get back to Kansas. She learns that she had within her the whole time, the ability to get what she really wanted. And that, um, you know, I think that is is the story that a lot of entrepreneurs face as well. A lot of people follow this path that they see other people going down because they think it's the right thing to do. They're following these marketing wizards who they think are, more than human. They've, they've got the secret sauce. They've got it all figured out. And, and eventually you go down this road to the point where you've realized that they're just, an, they're just another human being. They're just winging it. You know, they're maybe a step or two further along than you are, but they don't have some magic formula that makes everything else easier or, or, you know, and not to mention that, but uh, along the way you build the skills that you need to actually get to where you wanted to go. So you set out on this journey and, you know, let's say you want to, you want to start a business, you want to help people, you want to leave an impact, create a legacy, whatever it is, you know, earn, earn your freedom. But then you get into this online status game where all you're trying to do is get more Instagram followers and get more clients so that you can post about how many clients you have. And it becomes sort of a status dog pile where everything is about, increasing your status. And and there's, you know, there's value in status, but you lose sight of helping people and you lose sight of freedom and you lose sight of a lot of the original goals that you had. And you get, you know, halfway down that road and realize that 
you've done the things that you need to do. If anything, you need to do less than you're currently doing and peel that back. And I, I noticed that that story is the, it's basically the same story as, as the alchemist. Um, if you've ever read that really popular book, it's the same story as the greatest showman, which is one of my very favorite movies of all time. It's the same story as the game by Neil Strauss, which is a, a book about his experience in the dating world. And I think, you know, whether you're telling sort of kind of long-winded way of looping back to your, your last point, but when you're telling a story, whether it's your own story or it's someone else's story, maybe it's a testimonial of some kind, or it's a story about what you did over the weekend, or you took your dog for a walk or something that you saw a movie you watched on Netflix, knowing and understanding those different story archetypes gives you a really easy way to connect the dots between something that's completely unrelated to what you teach and what you, what you help your audience do to something that is exactly that what they need to hear and it exactly relates to what they're trying to what they're trying to overcome the the problem that they're struggling with so those those links you can easily move between stories and you can talk about the wizard of oz and then you can talk about the game or you can talk about how it applies to online business because they're the same the same story archetype just with a different world a different feel to it Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. And, and I think, you know, I mean, I guess it's one of these things, right? I mean, to your point that people are just people and they, you know, they're not some superhero or, or they, they don't know something you don't know or <laughs> whatever. Like, I sort of feel like it's, um, you know, every, every story is kind of the same, right? Like you said, it's got a different facade on it, you know, whether it's Wizard of Oz or, or whatever, but it's all kind of the same, right? So if we sort of, I guess, look back at our humanity and sort of gel over the fact that we're all people and we're all doing the same things, then we can come to the, you know, come to conversation or content creation from like an authentic place, right? Because we all have the same stuff going on in us. And so I, I think that that's all, uh, all really great and well said. Um, so I've noticed that uh, while doing some research on you, your number one kind of place that you're putting stuff out there is your blog. Um, I, I looked on uh, LinkedIn to try and find, you know, like do some research and you don't really have very many posts on there. Um, and uh, I kind of actually like that. I kind of like that. It's, um, you know, I've, I've been noticing on LinkedIn lately because um, I use it for job searching and, and stuff like that quite frequently. And uh, you, you see these, these posts that are almost like, I'm going to post something sad just to get likes. I'm going to post something that is political just to get likes. I'm going to post something. And it's like, um, I like the fact that you have your one place, you do your, your, your writing and you post it on your blog. If people want to come to you. They come to you. And that's almost more like a more authentic approach because you're, you're developing those followers who follow you for, what you do not for your sympathy post or your, you know, this or that. And, um, you know, I, I used to be guilty of doing the same thing on Instagram back in the day. I'd, you know, Oh, I'm DJing here. Come check this out or look at how many people are dancing in my club. You know, and it's like, um, I don't know. I just don't care about that stuff anymore. And I, I, I like with our, our podcast here, I don't really even hardly post anything unless it's like a really cool guest or something really unique that we're doing. I'll post about that, but very rarely do I do that. And um, I just wanted to kind of bring that to the forefront that I, I noticed you're really only posting on your blog. Um, was that a conscious decision of, on your part to do that? It was. So, yeah. So one of the things that you, both of you guys just picked up on there was the idea of authenticity and that, you know, that's something that's really important to me. It's something that I work with a lot of, a lot of my customers on is it feels like a barrier. Sometimes people can't really put themselves out there in an authentic way. And um, with the social media thing, yeah, I just felt the same way. You know, it was such a battle to try to win that status dog pile. It, it, it wasn't good for me. Didn't make me feel good. I don't like being on social media. I, I think there's, there's certainly benefits to it. I, you know, in some of my weaker moments, I, I 
I think, yeah, you know, I need to get back on social media because when I, when I tell people that I don't use social media for my business, I get one of two reactions, which is one is sort of amazement. Um, the other is an offer to, uh, consult me on my social media strategy (laughs) and, uh, you know, but I'm not, not interested in using social media for marketing because I haven't, I haven't figured out a good way to do it that is authentic to the way that I want to communicate with, with my audience. And so, and I haven't found a way to do it in a way that's sustainable for me because I just, social media makes me depressed and it makes me angry and I don't want to be on there. So I I use YouTube a little bit and that's about it. Uh, I don't, don't do any LinkedIn. I don't do any Instagram. Uh, I definitely don't do any TikTok or anything like that. I don't really understand a lot of those platforms. I see, I see a lot of value in networking on, on Twitter, for example, but I I've made the conscious decision to stick with email and my blog, because that's a a way for me to intentionally communicate with the people who are following me, who are signed up, you know, who are going to my website who are, or who are, uh, you know, trading me their email address in exchange for some of the, the training that I have on my website there, they want to get the content. It's not me trying to interrupt them, trying to jam my content down their, their throat or to try to get them to do something because all of the content on social media has an alternative agenda. You know, it's not really there to teach people. It's there to get people's attention so that they will follow you or they will buy from you or they will do something else. And obviously you have to give some value in order to be able to do that effectively. And that's kind of the trade-off, right? Is this person's giving out more value. So more people are going to follow them. So then I need to give more value. So they'll come back and look at me and, that's just not the game that I want to play. And I, I fully understand that my business is going to grow more slowly because of that. You know, I, I'm, I'm not getting any organic traffic from social media platforms and that's okay. I'm, I'm comfortable with that at, at this point. I, I really enjoy doing podcasts like this, you know, just having a conversation, uh, just hanging out, talking about marketing, talking about whatever. I really enjoy doing this. And, um, this is a better way, a more fun way for me to direct traffic back to my website, to get people on my email list. And so that's why I like to do it. And it's something that I can see myself doing for the long term. You know, I can yeah. be doing this forever. And that's the thing about email too, is it's like I download a copy of my list. I've got it offline. It just have all the email addresses. Cause I, you know, I own that information I can take it with me. I can, I can always put that stuff on social media if I want, but email has been around for 25 plus years. It's probably going to be around for a, a while longer. Social media platforms are changing all the time. You don't get access to all that information. You can't take your list with you. If you say something that doesn't align perfectly with the narrative, you're gone and yeah. your, your company's gone and your list is gone. And I've known multiple people who have lost hundreds of thousands of followers and seven figure businesses with the snap of their, of, you know, the Instagram algorithm, sorry, you don't comply, you're gone. Yep. And it's that fast. Well, and I like that you brought that up because you own all your email, all your contacts, you own that and you'll have that. And you can, you don't have to be, like you said, uh, at the whim of meta or Facebook or Instagram, you know, all these different platforms. And as a, as someone who, if I was a customer of yours or someone that was following your work, you know, I don't want to be scrolling through Instagram and every third thing's an ad for something I don't need. And every, you know, um, it, it's, it's, it's just another more authentic approach. And I appreciate that. And I, I, uh, I admire that actually. So yeah, I think uh, it's one of the things that both draws both me and Mike to podcasting, you know, as a platform is, you really do get the opportunity to know somebody, you know, and in a, in a short form like ours, where it's about an hour long, I mean, of course we can't know the depths of your soul. Right. But you know, there we are try. podcasters who, <laughs> but there are podcasters who've been around long enough and, and maybe their shows are long enough or whatever that you really do get a taste for who they are as a human. And uh, you know, and then that can inform your decisions. Do I want to work with this individual because I truly believe that they're this type of person or whatever. And, and that will work for some people and not for others. And that's okay. Like, you know, you just have to be okay with that. 
you know, me and my wife were talking about this the other day. Um, and I, I came up with this idea. I haven't totally baked it out, but it's this idea that social media is really just narcissism masked in community. So hey. actually like we're, that. we're trying to come off as if we care about a community and we're trying to build a community, but it's really about us. Right. So it's, it's actually just a deep narcissism more than it is an actual care about community. And I think that that's where this um, inauthenticity lies is that, you know, you're trying to communicate yourself, but anytime you're like, I guess, speaking from the pulpit, right? So you're, you're speaking one to many, you know, you can't articulate all the things that make you human. You can't articulate the things that are, make you authentic, or at least seemingly you can't do it very well, or, or, you know, maybe it's easy for some people. I don't know. But in my case or in my situation, I know that my LinkedIn posts or my, uh, especially like Instagram and stuff like that, which are few and far between are, you know, almost always a sales, sales pitch of some kind. You know, I keep a Facebook account strictly to thank everybody on my birthday every year for the well wishes. Like, I mean, but like, I, I don't have an interaction with them. I don't do anything, but if I write a book one day, I might want to be able to put it out there, <laughs> you know, like, so, but I mean, but again, it's very self-centered, right? It's not about building a community. It's about, well, maybe one day I want to move a book, you know? And so, but I think that that's where social media really goes kind of askew. And I think that's why, you know, sort of what you're identifying is that it's difficult to be authentic in those spaces. And I always sort of saw LinkedIn as the last bastion of being able to sort of just be a professional, but it's uh, not that way point, anymore. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. backsliding so quickly. I can't even deal. In fact, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing what will probably be a very controversial article, even though it's not controversial at all, but I'm seeing like a, a, enormous percentage of people, far more people than you think should be doing it, that are job seekers out there looking for, for work. And they're leading with, um, you know, what's wrong with them or their pronouns or what makes them special or whatever. And almost none of them talk about what, it, what value they could bring to a potential employer. Right. And so I, I read a, read one today that is this list of things that, you know, these are all the things about me. You know, I have a nose ring. I, I, I have three cats, you know, whatever it is. Here's 12 things. And then the next list is what makes me professional. I care about my job, all these things. And then it was something like, you know, these things aren't mutually exclusive, you know, having, you know, just because I have a nose ring doesn't mean I'm not a professional. And that sentiment I agree with. Right. I mean, just because you have a nose ring doesn't mean you don't have other good qualities. But the problem is with some of these posts that I've been reading, it's almost like the nose ring is the qualification, right? Like the, the thing I bring to the table is not that I'm a, you know, an amazing content writer, rather it's that I have blue hair and three cats, right? And so there's like been this shift in terms of what's important and what makes a professional and what works for fi you know, finding a job or what counts as being professional. And so, and I think that there's a lot going wrong on, on a platform like the LinkedIn these days. Yeah, I think that's something that, I think that, that problem, it may be new to LinkedIn, but I think it's a problem that's been going on for a long time. I was, I was reading this book by Earl Nightingale, who's, uh, you know, older, old school, kind of, um, one of the original self-help guys. I don't know if, if, uh, he'd like me saying he's a self-help guy, but anyways, <laughs> uh, his book lead the field, which I think was orig originally an audio program. And he's got this story where he was sitting at a, coffee shop or something. And there was a young couple next to him. And the guy was saying, man, no, nobody will give me a job. Nobody will give me a job in town. We're going to have to go back you know, to live with my parents or whatever, something, and, you know, woe is me. Like I can't get anybody to give me a job. And Earl Nightingale was saying, no, dude, you've got it completely backwards. You've got to go figure out how you can add value to a company. And then you add that value and then they'll pay you for whatever value you add. And it's not about, you don't just deserve a job. You need to go out there and, and add value to the marketplace. I actually, I, um, I have a story about that in my own life experience. Um, I, I was, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to like to my own horn or anything like that, but I've always been very self-motivated to go out and, you know, I was cutting firewood when I was 14, trying to make money and, and this and that. And, my, uh, a good friend of mine, um, we were about 15, 16 years old. Actually, I was 17. Um, he did window washing. And uh, one day we got up and, you know, we, we need to generate some clients for his window washing business. And uh, I got dressed up in a shirt and tie and went to car dealerships and pitched him in for window washing uh, to for my buddy to come and wash his windows. And I was just trying to help him out kind of thing. And uh, I walked into this uh, Chevrolet dealership in Gig Harbor, Washington and 
pitched him on window washing and got hired as a car salesman because of it. So it's like, it, it, I wasn't expecting to get a job out of the equation, but because I took the initiative to get dressed up in a shirt and tie to go sell window washing for my friend, I got a car sales position at a 17 years old, almost 18 and uh, bought my first car when I was barely 18 and ruined my life because of it. But <laughs> it was one of those <laughs> things where I was like, you know, it, you, you take that initiative to kind of take that first step and try and hustle to, to do your own thing, whatever it is, you, you know, things will come because of it. So, but yeah, that's the thing. I mean, yeah. businesses have business needs, right? That means that, that when you come here, like we need to re generate revenue, we need to increase our number of customers. We need to do all this different stuff. So the fact that you are really fun and have this great outgoing personality, maybe that will contribute to this. You know, maybe you will be a better salesperson because you're outgoing and you're not afraid of doing that. So maybe that is a positive, but maybe you'll also dick around a lot and you'll spend a lot of time at your water cooler and you won't be doing your work and stuff, you know, so like that same characteristic could go either way, you know, so focusing on that versus, you know, like you just uh, descri described, you know, where you actually demonstrated expertise or <laughs> demonstrated capability anyway, you know, obviously resonated with that person and, and that turned into work. Yeah. I think it's, it's, uh, you know, it's fine to, to share your qualities and what makes you unique, but then you need to spin that into some kind of value add, right. Where it's like, oh, I'm outgoing and I'm friendly and I'm easy to talk to. So it's going to be really easy for me to build rapport with prospective customers uh, or, you know, if you're in a sales role or, or customer service or something like that, but it's like, yeah, Mike, if you're going to car dealership and you're flat out demonstrating your sales skills, they're like, Hey, forget about windows. <laughs> like let's get you selling some automobiles. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a very unique, um, situation there. I wasn't expecting that. And it, as a kid, you know, I was just like, Hey, let's make a hundred bucks over the weekend. Do these guys windows maybe it'll be a recurring thing and uh turned into a recurring thing that i wasn't expecting so. well and to your point andrew <laughs> which i guess you know you're actually pulling from the book but the uh the point was that you know people are looking at it backwards right they're looking at it as there's already a job waiting for me you know so you should appreciate me for all these things right because the job's already there it's a foregone conclusion you know instead of this other you know other way around where it's like you know what actually you have to earn your way in you know and I was having a conversation on LinkedIn. It's one of the few places I'm active. And, and recently I've been trying to be a little bit more active in comments and things like that. And somebody was talking about how difficult it was for junior talent, junior, junior designers to find opportunities in, in jobs. Like, you know, it's really difficult for them. Apparently, you know, most employers, according to this forum or this, this discussion, most employers are looking for senior level people, but want to pay them as juniors. But so no juniors can qualify, but the seniors don't want the work because it's too cheap and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So anyway, there's this weird dichotomy on the hiring side that makes it really difficult for these folks to find jobs. And one of the, the comments I made, which was, you know, sneered at was, was something to the effect of the, the, the post writer had seemed to indicate that yes, things are going to be hard, but you sort of need to lift yourself up and do the work, like go out and fight. And, you know, I mean, it's a battlefield, right? You're competing with all these other junior designers. And there was a number of people who thought that this concept of having to fight for it was almost like not virtuous, right? That, that somehow, <clears throat> somehow it was better to not, you know, overwork yourself or, or any of this stuff. And, and in the grand scheme, it's not right. I mean, obviously you don't want to be overworked and you don't want to be underpaid and, and all this stuff. But I mean, you know, at least in a capitalistic society, like the one here in this country, you know, the market generally sets the rules, right? So if somebody's willing to work for that price, well, then that's the price. Like, it doesn't matter whether you think you should get paid more or not, but if somebody's willing to, you know, bang it out for that amount of money, then, you know, then you just don't have a lot of say in the matter. And so my whole point was that, you know, it's always going to be competition. So you either A, have to show how you provide more value than the alternative, or B, you have to be willing to hustle and take more or, you know, take more abuse or whatever it is, right? I mean, but you've got to be able to uh, somehow stand out in a lineup, right? You have to be different than, than everybody else. And, and it just, I, I don't know. It was not a very popular comment. Of course, it was much more articulate when I could sit and think about it, but it was, uh, you know, but nonetheless, like it seemed very common to me, this idea that you need to work hard and you'll, and you'll find a way. And, you know, if there's not a way in front of you, then make your way. And uh, apparently that's not a widely held belief. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of an interesting dichotomy. I don't know if that's the right word, but 
there's a culture in some platforms that you have to be hustling and you have to be miserable. And the more miserable you are and the more that you're suffering, the, the more status you have in these communities. But a lot of times the, that amount of hustling and misery doesn't really translate into the kind of hard work that, that you guys are talking about here. You know, it's more of, um, how much you can learn or how much content you can consume and how little sleep you can get that, uh, that earn you status in these, in these communities. But I think that, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, as you say, Ryan, there's definitely ways that you can, you can earn more money given the constraints of the market. Yeah. And the, the person who comes to mind would be Dan Kennedy, who's, his claim to fame, I mean, he's a legendary copywriter and, and businessman, but his favorite title is that he's the highest paid copywriter in the world. And he's not the highest paid copywriter because he charges the highest rates, but because he's the fastest writer. And because he's the fastest writer, he can do more jobs in the same amount of time as, as someone else who maybe charges 50% more, but works you know, a third of the pace, for example. So if if you can do the same quality at a faster rate, then you can you can make more money in that way. But there's there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can differentiate yourself and and not just competing on price. Because especially when you know with with folks coming in from from other countries, or you know, there's always going to be someone who's willing to do the work for cheaper than you will be most of the time someone else will be willing to do it for cheaper. So, you know, this is another, another thing that, uh, that I learned from Dan Kennedy is you, know, you can't compete with Walmart on price. They're always going to come in cheaper. They get huge, huge discounts. You know, they'll bully people into their suppliers into getting them just the cheapest possible prices. And, and that's the only way to win on price. So you have to find something else that makes your, package program whatever it is that you're selling more valuable and it it's if you differentiate yourself on something that makes you unique it's not something that anyone else can compete on so if if you have the lowest price and that's your differentiating factor then next week when you're undercut you're not the lowest price and nobody's ever going you know nobody looks for the second lowest price everybody's either looking for the lowest one right or they're looking for the highest one depending on who you're marketing to you know some people like to to you know improve their status in their social communities by spending the most money on various products and services you know cars for example um so there's there's multiple ways you can differentiate yourself and and when it comes back to content creation if you're trying to if you're trying to differentiate your programs or whatever it is that you're selling online you're probably not going to want to be the cheapest right because somebody's always going to be able to undercut you on cost and you're just going to go down to the margins and it's going to it's going to make your business collapse so you've got to find something that is unique to you, some additional value add that you can bring that, that nobody else can bring. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I actually um, have been uh, very impressed with your recollection ability to um, pull up a quote, reference the author in the book, and you've done it probably 10 times today. And um, I, I have, you know, I'll, I'll spend a lot of time listening to audiobooks. And I'll, uh, you know, I'll have the concept in my head, but I can't remember the author, let alone the book, unless I Google it real quick while I'm having the conversation. I think, oh, that that's a good reference, and then I'll pull it up and and I can pull it that way. But um, I was wondering if maybe you could, um, you you're obviously well read, um, and I think that comes with the the um, content creation portion of things because you have to do research on certain things. But can you maybe Tell us a little bit about your study habits, your your workday, um, what you do as far as processes, as far as um, generating content. Um, I'm sure it's not just a matter of um, I just start typing and it comes. I, I, I think you probably do a little research beforehand. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? So to, I'll start with the first part of your um, of your question, which is around the 
um, recollection of ideas and quotes and things. I have a system that I use for that. So it, it's Jim quick course. I was just going to say that. <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 I have read <laughs> his book on. limitless. Um, yeah, me too. I've read that and uh, it comes, it's sort of related to Tiago Forte's building a second brain. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but he just, just released a book about it and he's got a, a pretty successful program that he runs. I haven't taken it, but I've read some of his free stuff and just sort of modeled it based on things that I've seen him doing, just free content that I've seen. But when I, well, first of all, I don't really, I don't love audio or video for learning. There's a lot of really good, really valuable content in audio and video formats, but it's difficult to get it into a, it's difficult to store that information. You, you need a, a clip or you need a transcript and transcripts are often not perfect. So there's errors in those, um, you know, there's apps that you can use. Like I, I used to listen to just podcasts all the time and I could never, you know, I lost a lot of that information because I never had a way to write it down or to save it. And now they have apps where you can do sort of highlighting of the, of the audio where you can select two points in time and it'll transcribe all the, the words that, that are spoken in that period of time. And then it'll save that information, um, you know, down, to, down to your phone or to an app. So everything that I'm consuming, whether it's audio, audio video, if I'm taking notes on it, uh, that's what I like to do is I'll just take notes. If it's written, I'll, I'll use a highlighter and I'll, I'll go through and just highlight things that are important. I'll add a note in the margin. If I'm reading on Kindle, you can easily do a highlight and add a note, just whatever spoke to you. If it's a content idea that I'm of something I'm reading, highlight it, tag it as a content idea. If it's um, just a, something that I think will be useful for me, I will just jot down why I think it's going to be useful, whatever context for why I'm making the highlight. And then I take, so I have an app on my phone that you can take a photo of a, a book of a paperback or hardback book, you can take a photo of it and and click on the section that you've highlighted and it will pull that into a digital format. There's also tools you can use to get information, to get your highlights out of like a Kindle um, book. You can get all of your, your highlights out of that. And all of that goes into a web app that I use called Notion. I use Notion. Is, yeah. yeah, okay, so you know about Notion. So I just dump all of my highlights, all of, everything into notion and y'all, you know, I'll have a, I have basically a big table for all the content that I'm consuming and I'll, I'll have one, you know, basically one row in that table, which is a new page has all the highlights for any specific thing. So if it's, if it's anything you want by Derek Sivers, it's got its own page with all my highlights in there. If it's lead the field by Earl Nightingale, you know, that's a separate page with all my highlights in there. So I bring all that in and then I'm supposed to, and I've been really bad about this. I haven't done this in, in probably six months. So uh, <laughs> it, just to put that out there before I tell you this, but the, the, the way the system is supposed to work is then you go through and you do what's called progressive summarization, which is an idea from, from Tiago Forte, who I mentioned, who has this building a second brain course and book. And the idea with progressive summarization is that you're organizing the information so that it's not just a list of everything that you highlighted, but that you can go back and you can quickly understand what it was that was valuable from that. You don't have to read through, you know, 20 pages of highlights, especially if it's a long book, uh, you, you can get the idea quickly. So you pass through it first and you would bold sections of your highlights. You just go through the list of your highlights and you read them and you say, oh, that, that one's really good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bold that and you go through one more pass with bold. Then you do a second pass with a highlighter and you highlight of the bold sections, you highlight the even most important um, of the bold. So you're adding layers to this. You've got, if you have 30 seconds, you can just look at your highlights and see what are the three to five most important things. If you have a 10 minutes, you know, maybe you can look at the bold. And if you want a complete refresher on the book, you can look at all the, all of the notes you took, all the highlights you took. And then the final step 
of this would be to summarize, say, three to five points. What's the main purpose of the book in your own words? What are the key concepts here that and how do they relate to your life or how do they relate to um, whatever this is, the book is applicable to. Obviously, you probably wouldn't do this with with a fiction book, but with nonfiction, you, you want to take that information and apply it to your life. So like I said, obviously, it's a really tedious process. I haven't really done the second half of all the analysis, but I do pull in all of my highlights and I read them again. So they, they tend to get a little bit more sticky. Um, Something else that really helps me recall this type of information is I will write a lot of content using this information. So I take all these things that I'm learning. Oh, Derek Sivers has this quote that I love. I'm going to write a piece of content about it and about how I, how I think about it. And so all of, all of my content, I think of like Legos. And we were talking about that at the beginning. And, and the way that I use these Legos is then I can mix and match them and build different creations by taking this idea and that idea. And, you know, there's all these similar threads, but to get those individual building blocks, I'll take, say this quote from Derek Sivers and I'll write a one single piece of content, 300 to 500 words is usually how, how my emails and my blog posts come out. And I will explain, you know, it, it's a screenshot at that point in time of my thoughts about the, whatever, whatever quote or story that I'm discussing. Uh, it's my thoughts about how it relates to business. It's my thoughts about how it relates to the world at large, current events, whatever is going on in my mind is going into that little block of 300 to 500 words. And then it goes into my database, which is in notion for all the content that I create. And it's in there. And I will add some tags, add some other sort of metadata. So then I can come back. And if I want to write a, longer form post or assemble an ebook or something, I can search and pull up all the content that is related to a particular topic. And then obviously there's some editing and there's some mixing and matching and things that have to be done to really pull that all together. But the ideas are captured as a screenshot in that point in, at that point in time. And that, um, that really helps me with remembering the quotes, remembering where they come from. That's probably, you know, taking that idea and Expressing it in your own words is probably the number one thing that helps with with remembering it. It's it's kind of like um, uh, I've taken Jim Quick's courses too for the the Limitless and the the memory uh, recollection. And one thing he he talks about when uh, you meet someone, it, and lots of times you'll meet someone, and two seconds later you forget their name. And part of remembering it is actually to say it a few times, like "Hey, Eric, nice to meet you." Hey, Eric, nice to meet you. Or you know, whatever. Just say say the name two or three times, and then it it has it's that stickiness factor that you mentioned. Um, I I love the fact that you do metadata in notion to be able to search by topic and tags. Um, when you actually get into the writing process, do you do anything as far as like, do you use Scrivener? Are there any apps that you use to focus on writing or do you just kind of do it all in notion? Yeah, I, I use, I use notion for everything. Um, I've tried a lot of different platforms and, like for example, Rome Research. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but the the purpose of Rome Research is similar to Notion, but it has a really powerful ability to link together your ideas if you're diligent in the way that you manage your database. So if you're in there and you're making links between ideas, you know you can you can be reading an article, for example, and a keyword in that article. You can then click on it and you can see all of the other content in your library that relates to that keyword. I just struggled to really get all of my books and everything that I, all the content I was consuming, I struggled to get it to that a hundred percent mark where it was, you know, I am a hundred percent done with all of everything that I would want to do with this, with all the tagging and all of the highlighting and the summarization and getting to 80% just wasn't enough to really get the value out of rum research. So I went back to notion and honestly, I've, I've played around with this stuff and with a lot of the productivity type software is it, you know, it always feels like, 
oh, I got to get to the next, you know, this one has this super awesome feature. And so you move everything over, but you just spend too much time moving your stuff around and you don't actually do anything with your ideas. Yeah. So I, you know, I prefer notion. I, like I said, I have a, a table set up where I write all my content in. I just go in every morning, hit a new page and I just start writing. And, um, I have, so I have a separate, I get, I have basically three databases that I use regularly. One is for all the content that I'm consuming, everything that I'm reading and studying and learning. The second is for the content that I'm creating. So every day I sit down and I write an email and it goes into that database. And then the third is what I call my idea bank. So this is basically the shortcut on my phone where whenever I have an idea for a piece of content, I pull up that table, I open up a new page and I just write a sentence of a fragment. I write a whole, you know, couple of paragraphs, write a headline, whatever inspiration comes to me and just get it in there because I, you know, I have forgotten so many amazing yeah. ideas because I didn't write them down. They were, you know, too good to forget, but I forgot them because I didn't write them down. So, so I, I love that you do that because I do something very similar with a few different things. Um, I use voice notes where if I'm driving, I hit record and then I, I make a quick comment of it. But as a DJ, um, I'll get this idea for a mashup or uh, uh, something that I, Oh man, that'd be great. What if I did that word play into this song? But if you forget that that word play into this song works really well, you'll never do it again, or you never make that custom edit. So lots of times I'll have my, um, you know, my software open for DJing while I'm actually doing it. If it works really good, I'll take a picture of the two songs that worked good together. And then I'll, you know, two or three months later, I'm going through back through my photos. I'm like, oh man, that was, that was great. That worked awesome. And that's my mental recognition to, you know, try it again or make a custom edit of this or do that. And um, I, I think it's very critical that when you have that idea, if you don't document it or, or like even Shazam, like I use, if you looked at my Shazam history, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's a, I'm in a Rite Aid and, you know, a, a song I haven't heard in 20 years comes up on the radio. I'll Shazam it just so I remember to go get that track or, you know, it's just, it's critical to, if you're going to be professional and, and creating stuff, you have to rec recall what ideas you had at the time and, and be able to pull them out and actually use them. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> no, I yeah. think that was super helpful just in that, I mean, I read a lot, but I don't retain much. And so like, I, I feel like I'm constantly doing that, but I do find when I write, um, you know, especially if I've done it freshly after reading something, I will, uh, I'll tend to use a lot of the same language. Like I'll, I'll kind of repeat phrases or keep working on the same phrase said differently a bunch of different times, and then eventually it'll stick. But there's a, a you know, just swaths of books that I've read that like I could never point back to. <laughs> and so, so this is all super helpful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I had the same problem and it's, you know, it's kind of a shame to, at least to me, like to think that I spent all this time trying to learn these, learn these things, but I lost, I lost that time. You know, you spend a lot of time reading a book or, or um, listening to podcasts or, or whatever, but it's difficult. You know, I, I, go look at my library and I'll pull up a book that I read three or four years ago. And I think, man, I wish I would have had some notes on this. I wish I would have highlighted it when I read it so I could quickly remember what, what it was that really spoke to me when I read it. But, you know, I don't, I don't have that information. So, and, and, you know, one other thing I'll say too, is talking about it, it makes it sound like it's a really big, difficult process to go through. Um, but I, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel super cumbersome to me, at least the way that I have it. And like I said, I'll take it 75 or 80% of the way with at least just getting my highlights into notion and I can come back to them. Maybe someday I'll get around to doing the progressive summarization on it, but it works for me. And, well, um, you know, it helps, helps me remember, remember I'm, stuff. I mean, so. if you think, if you think about like, you know, college or high school, when you, you're studying for an exam, when you're studying for an exam, you don't just read the textbook and be done with it. You're taking notes, you're taking, it's thoughtful 
research. It's not just, I'm going to glaze over this and hope I do well. Some people might have that ability, but I sure don't. I have to take notes and your, your approach to, you know, here's what I thought. This was the highlight portion. Here's my thoughts on the subject. And here's the metadata where I can find it later. That that's very thoughtful and very proactive approach to learning and to actual study instead of just, I'm just reading this to read this. And, you know, I think that's, you know, cause most of the time when I'm listening to an auto audio book, it's when I'm driving. So it's, mm-hmm. or when I'm working or, you know, like I'll be out in the yard mowing a lawn, I'm listening to a podcast. It's very hard to be intentful and to pull stuff out of that while you're mowing the lawn. So I think sitting down and actually doing the research with a, thoughtful and proactive approach is pretty much the key differentiator in in the equation. And it's the, the act active approach versus the passive approach. I think that's where it comes down to. Yeah. You know, I I have this compulsion to just want to be plugged in like, Oh, I'm, I'm mowing the lawn or I'm whatever. Like I got to be listening to something, an audio book or podcast, like got to be productive while I'm doing this. But I kind of have to slow my down, uh, slow myself down, and and think. You know, if I'm really intending to get something actionable about of uh, out of this video or this podcast, if I want to really remember this information, I need to sit there and I need to take notes on it. And it's kind of infuriating sometimes because I I can't sit still for long enough while I'm listening to an audio and just taking notes, but if you want to really get the information out of it, that's, I I mean, that's what works for me because I'll half listen to an audio while I'm doing something else. And then a week later, I, you know, an hour later I'll remember, but a week later or a month later or a year later, it'll be gone. I can't even tell you how many times I've been listening to a book or something and and have to actually stop it at that time, (laughs) rewind and listen to it again, because I, the last five minutes I didn't even get and you get lost in a, you know, a thought or this or something distracts you. Um, it, it's, it, you just have to be intentful and proactive in your learning if you want to retain. Yep. So, um, well, thank you so much for your time. We're kind of at that point. Um, it's, it doesn't feel like it's been an hour, but it's been an hour and 10. Uh, it's one of those conversations that just, we could talk here for another two hours, probably and be <laughs> totally fine with it. Um, where can people reach out, maybe join your newsletter and, um, you know, get in touch with you. Yeah. The best place to get in touch with me is at my website, andrewbrider.com. And, uh, I'm teaching a lot about entrepreneurship, content creation, a lot of the stuff that we talked about here today, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more that we didn't get into. And if you're interested in improving your, your content game, be more authentic in, the way that you present yourself and your brand. Uh, I I do have a training that I give away to everyone who subscribes to my newsletter that will show you a framework that I use for uh, creating these stories, creating these impactful pieces of content. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, no, it's funny you say that, Mike, because I was thinking to myself that, God, we could go on another hour. I mean, like literally I'm looking here at like the list of questions and topics and stuff that, that we've got scrawled out in front of us and God, we, we barely touched any of them. Like, I mean, there's another, there's like two more shows in there. So anyway, it was a, a great conversation and thanks so much for just exploring some of these ideas with us. It was a, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week and we'll see you guys next time.